This is Chicagoland's place to inspire, equip, and encourage Christian business leaders. Faith Marketplace Radio. Jennifer Villarreal here. Welcome back. We're on AM 1160, Faith Marketplace Radio. And our first guest is a chaplain at the Lake County Jail in Waukegan. And can you believe this was the same jail that he was once incarcerated in? He's a two-time author, and copies of his most recent book have been placed in the Lake County Jail for the inmate access. Um, welcome, George Moore, founder of Legacy Reentry Foundation. Woo-hoo. Hello, family. <laughs> How you doing, Jennifer and Bob? Woo-hoo. Audience, how's everybody doing? Great, great. So, George, why don't you tell me, what is Legacy Reentry Foundation? Sure. Legacy Reentry Foundation is a basically a faith-based nonprofit organization designed to help the formerly incarcerated to reintegrate back into society. Mm. And, and so where is Legacy located? Great. We're right up the street, actually, from the jail. And so being close to the jail, when people come out of the jail, uh, they can come up to us and get uh, resources like empowerment, um, education, employment, um, some fundamental things they need to to get back into society. And so we're right there for them. And one of the interesting things about that is the same city that I was born in, it's also the same city that I was once incarcerated in. Mm -hmm. And so, which is a classic story for a lot of people in the community. And so that's one of the things that we address, you know, your environment and try to give you a different um, environment, different atmosphere. So when you say these uh, resources are fundamental, uh, were, are they just not there for them right now? Like what's going on out there? Well, we, we pride ourselves in giving relevant resources. Uh, it's not that the resources aren't there, but a, a lot of organizations say to people who are formerly incarcerated, let's give you a job immediately because they think that's what everybody needs. Um, that's not necessarily the case all the time. Uh, sometimes people are insubordinate, uh, they're not ready to work. And some of these guys are so smart, so educated, so ready, they need to become entrepreneurs as opposed to working for somebody else. Um, they don't have the patience to be in the job place or the market. Mm-hmm. And so, um, you know, faith in the marketplace for them is actually becoming an entrepreneur mm-hmm. and starting their own business. And then um, and they don't have to worry about a background check or somebody coming a year later after they work so hard and saying, hey, we don't want you anymore. Mm-hmm. So that's relevant for them. Yeah. So we try to teach sense. and help them with that. Yeah. So first of all, can we start with why even our listeners should be sensitive to this ministry of reentry? and helping the formerly incarcerated? Good question. First of all, I just want to put this out as a disclaimer. Um, We're not saying that uh, people who commit crimes and want to to offend you and want to take your money and take, we're not saying that we want to just help them out for no reason. Um, Some people aren't ready for help. So you're, you're basically saying like Christians don't necessarily need to be tolerant of a crime, but is you know, it, but do those do do the people want help to begin with? Exactly. Mm-hmm. I'm not saying we're trying to be we're, we're not condoning criminal activity. We're saying there are people out there who want a second chance and who are caught up in um, in, in the system, you know, of recidivism and, and, and mass incarceration rather. And so and, and, and just to give you an example of that, you know, uh, just a biblical one, if you go to the average church. Uh, they're going to shout out something like Luke 19.10 and, um, you know, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Well, the the premise of that scripture is based on Zacchaeus, a man who was a tax collector, a sinner. And Jesus, you know, at, went paraphrasing. He just said, listen, I'm going to come into your house because he made an effort to go after Jesus, mm-hmm. where, where by everybody else was just in the crowd and in the press just looking at Jesus. Um, he made an effort. And so Jesus says, I'm coming to your house. Well, there were people around who saw that and said, how can you be a guest with a sinner? Yep. And so when they said this, here it is. Zacchaeus says, listen, I give half of my goods. I'll restore fourfold. I'm, I, and, and Jesus says, listen, he's just as much as a child of Abraham, a child of faith as any of you. Because he has exhibited the fruits of repentance. He has said, I want to start over. He wants a second chance. And so that's what we're saying. There are people out there who want a second chance. And and the example of that is Jesus saying, um, we, we need to restore people, you mm-hmm. know, and that's who I'm coming after. I want to set the captive free. There's too many examples of that. Mm-hmm. And so that's, you know, to make it plain for everyone, especially if you're a believer, 
listen, this is the heart of God. Let's 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 be more empathetic towards them. Yeah. You mentioned two words there, restore people, and then you also mentioned a bit ago, recidivism. Mm. Can you explain a little bit more what that means? Sure. There's a recurring failure cycle out there. Uh, we know that two-thirds of individuals who get out of jail within the first three years, they will recidivate or return back to jail. Uh, we know that, you know, this country that we live in, you know, it, it's, it holds 5% of the world's population, but it's accountable for 25% of the world's prisoners. Mm. Mm. Say that again. It, it, we, we hold 5% of the world's population, America does, mm-hmm. but we're accountable for 25% mm. of the world's prisoners. Mm. Uh, it's another show you, we yeah, talked about yeah. it to talk yeah, about, you know, but, but the point being is that uh, we live in a nation that, that basically lives and breathes off of mass incarceration. So some of these examples that Bob and I were discussing in the first segment, you know, is that really relevant? I mean, is that truth? You know, it seems like maybe a little bit of a far stretch. Can you help me understand that? That is so good. I was listening. You brought up some very good points. You know, when you think about just backing out your driveway or somebody that you love and, and, you know, involuntary manslaughter. You know, when I think of somebody like, you know, Bob, since you mentioned Mm -hmm. it, you know, you look at Bob and and you look at, you know, what he's accomplished. And and when you walk in a room with him, you're like, that's Bob Lambert. But, you know, he'll tell you he's not ashamed to tell you, listen, I have a background. Mm -hmm. And so here it is. What if he was never given the opportunity to move forward. There are people who made mistakes, foolish mistakes as a child, as a teen. We did all, we've all done something silly, as you mentioned earlier. Um, what if that was a life sentence? Mm. Mm-hmm. And that has become a life sentence for many people. I, I've too many stories of that. And so that is addressing mass incarceration. There are people swept into the system that basically some of them, not everybody belongs there. Some people can actually, if you just counsel them, help them start over, uh, they can be productive citizens. Yeah, yeah. So I'm hearing a lot of second chances here that yes. that we need to be open and sensitive to this. So why don't you tell me, George, why are you so sensitive to this topic and so involved in this particular ministry? I'm so passionate <laughs> about this subject is because it's my life. Um, you know, it happened to me. I was incarcerated for over two years. Some people have been incarcerated for longer, some shorter. But my experience is unique because when I got out, I understood um, there wouldn't be opportunities. But I didn't know that I would go to places where I expected acceptance. Um, you go to a church and, and, and they would be the ones that were most fearful of you, didn't understand. In what way? What do you mean by that? Well, um, you know, this person has a background. Okay, he's been incarcerated. So and you're labeled, basically. Basically mm-hmm. labeled. And, you know, let's be honest, some people are fearful of that. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. what were you incarcerated for? Why are you going to rob me? Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. Not everybody wants to, you know, do bodily harm to you because they made a mistake. And so with my personal story, I've had to try to find um, employment. I've had uh, my own employer, who, you know, before I went to jail, before I got indicted, um, she loved me. She was great with me when I told her, listen, I have to go away. Hopefully this job will be here uh, when I get back. She just kindly told me, get out of my face. Yeah, I, you're a criminal. I don't want to ever talk to you again. Mm-hmm. This was be- mm-hmm. I just got indicted. I didn't even fought the case yet. I said, mm-hmm. wait, wait. I just mm-hmm. So there was no time to explain my case like I'm able to explain it right now. Mm-hmm. And that happens to a lot of people in society. So I, that's a personal, that, that hits me hard because we have to be able to not only give people a second chance, we have to be empathetic towards these circumstances. And we have to understand, what if that was you? Mm-hmm. What if that was me? What if that happened to your son or your daughter or your mom? Mm-hmm. You know, and so, I, I mean, I recently had to counsel a, a woman who's getting ready to turn herself in for a white collar crime. And they want to give her not one year, two years, three, several years. And she's <laughs> repentant. She's remorseful. Um, her son sat next to us. He was asking questions. We were trying to prepare her for jail. She's worried about whether she's going to get assaulted in jail. Mm-hmm. And she has to address this with me in front of her son. Mm-hmm. This is a white collar crime that she made a mistake and she could start over easily with some counseling. But people are getting swept into the system and that hurts my heart. It's happened to me. It's happening to others. You made a mistake. Let's move on. So how is this crisis affecting, you know, us in our backyard or even the nation? Mm, Okay, this is (laughs) 
I, I talked about mass incarceration. I, I talked about recidivism. Uh, I, I think one of the things we fail to realize is that anybody can be redeemed. Um, in this nation, uh, we're, we're dealing with upwards of thousands of millions, actually two million right, right now that are in the system. Two million. Several million right now are currently in the system. Okay, wow, that's, that's, a sta- a big, that's a big number. That's the stat yeah. you could look at. So we understand it's happening, but I do know that you can be restored. You look at somebody like uh, Nelson Mandela, who was incarcerated for 27 years in his own nation, he became the president of the same nation that incarcerated him. Yeah. How come these young men and young women can't come out of the system and be more productive? Because it is a money-making venture to put people on probation for long exteri- uh, extents of time, a uh, long time and periods, and then they, they don't have hope. If they make one mistake, they're going back in. Mm-hmm. I was on probation for 10 years. Mm-hmm. Mm. So, But you're, you're not here talking about changing the system. What are you talking about changing? Excellent. I'm, I, I'm not so much as talking about the system as uh, opposed. Uh, I'm really talking about our attitude towards people who are involved in the system, who are caught up in the system. Our attitude. Yes. Mm-hmm. How do we respond to people who've been incarcerated? Yeah, I think that's a a really great point. And when we come back into the next segment that Bob is going to lead us, we're going to touch on that. You know, how can us as believers, the church, be active in this kind of ministry? And, you know, what, what could be missing that we need to help out with? All right, so you heard it here, folks, and I'm going to be back here with George Moore and just a little teaser, uh, and very special to me. I was just recently invited on to the board of Legacy Reentry, which I'm so proud of, yes. George. So this is a big passion for me because of getting introduced to this whole subject five years ago. So we're going to be right back, and we're going to let you know a little bit more about the impact this has in the marketplace. This is Chicagoland's place to inspire, equip, and encourage Christian business leaders. Faith Marketplace Radio. Hey, we're back here again. Bob Lambert, Faith Marketplace Radio, with our special guest, George Moore, the founder of Legacy Reentry Foundation. And as we said before we left the last one, that I now have got the privilege and the honor of being on the board of this. And uh, and I want to thank George for that because uh, it's near and dear to his heart and obviously Uh, He's made me much, much more aware of what's going on. Hey, let's clear something up, George, Uh, the term incarceration. What does that Hmm. really mean? I'm so glad you brought that up. If you've been in custody before, say you had a bar fight or you had a bad night and uh, authorities came to your house and, you you know, you were in handcuffs, Um, that being the case, you were locked up, you were incarcerated. I think um, sometimes we, we, we automatically uh, assume that somebody has been in prison mm-hmm. or in jail, and that's, okay, that's incarceration. Mm-hmm. Once you get in the system, in the system being you're on the record, you know, mm-hmm. something happened, you know, and that's what you do a lot of, of juvenile offenders. Um, it, unless their record gets sealed or expunged, um, just something that happened in high school can cause them to be an, uh, an inmate or incarcerated, rather. Got it. So... So the term is pretty inclusive of, of anything like that, where you've actually had a run in with the law and you've gotten kind of formally detained, or detained or whatever. Not so much that you went to court or got indicted or any of that kind of stuff. It's just it can be just that, right? That's yes. going to go on your record. I'm so glad you brought that up because now you know when people are listening to this, they might say, "Well, well I was in college and I had this little bar fight, and yeah, yeah you're a former inmate. <laughs> 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 you're, you're, you've been locked up before, okay. you know, so you should be able to identify with this." <laughs> well, listen, I know it's not a funny subject, but you're right. I mean, we don't think about these things as being that, but more importantly, is what you articulated earlier for us is. What does that really look like once you're in the system, and what can happen? Mm. And uh, and and you know, and it's weighted a different way. Uh, you know, I got to ask you. You know, because we've talked about this. What what do we as believers or the church uh, do? We have to be active with this kind of ministry. What you know, what what? How can we engage in this? Thing? Wow. Well, um, I always mention this. There's a well-known justice advocate named Brian Stevenson. He mentions proximity. Mm-hmm. The church needs to be more proximate. Uh, we as believers, if we want to be involved, we need to be close to the situation at hand. Um, if this is the hot button issue of the country next to recovery, maybe we should know something about it. Maybe we should be involved in some kind of way. We're not asking people to become overnight activists, mm-hmm. but to at least pray about it. 
to at least be sensitive, hear somebody's story, listen um, without being judgmental. Yeah, and I know the, the church that I attend, the chapel, is very actively involved in the jail ministry up there in Lake County, and we have a wonderful Christian, you know, uh, sheriff up there, which uh, we're going to have a little announcement about later. And, yes. And, uh, you know, we've had Mark on the show several times talking about these issues and, and what goes on. And I have to tell you, we are, we're, we're missing some of this stuff. I know there's a sensitivity with the church I belong to because people have gotten very involved in that, and mm-hmm. we have friends in common that have helped out up there. Um can you dispel any of these myths that uh, say we can't be be help these kind of people? They're, it's useless. Uh, they've been incarcerated or they're just beyond help. That That is so funny to me. I've heard this several times before. You know, I would love to be involved with you and what you're doing. That's great. But I've never been incarcerated before. Mm-hmm. So I can't help you. Mm. <laughs> like, well, you know, I just I was in Graham and there was a lot of big guys in there like myself, and we we're all, you know, thugs, whatever you want to call them. A lot of people in there, you, you can label them what you want to label them. But we had these two uh, Caucasian gentlemen, older gentlemen, real old, who came in, never involved in crime. They told us our, their backgrounds were squeaky clean, college, all this and that, and great neighborhoods. But when they came in there, they had such a compassion for us that we wouldn't let you touch them. Mm. I mean, these older men, we loved them. And when they hugged you, you you melted. And it was it's just a love they had for us and an understanding and a listening ear. And so that's what I'm talking about. If there's any empathy, or any compassion, that's the grace of God that would supersede you having any background in this particular area. You right. don't have to have cancer to help somebody or to understand somebody who has cancer to love on them. I mean, isn't that kind of the... The only two commandments we really got to be driving home, love the Lord your God first and then love your neighbor as yourself. Wow. I mean, <laughs> let's put a pencil on and point on this whole thing because it's yeah. really what we're about in the church. Often time I think we don't understand this compassion and, and getting out into the community and, and understanding the other side of what's going on in life because you know, we want to just shut that off. You know, we want to we put that in a can or put that in a container and not recognize, you know, this is an issue. Can I touch on that briefly, sure. very briefly? Um, there's a scripture in James that talks about giving people that which is needful for the body. Mm-hmm. You know, somebody comes and they're poor, come to you and they, right. they don't have resources. And you say, hey, go go be warmed and be filled. Mm-hmm. You prophesy, preach to them and give them a great uh, encouraging word and send them away. That that the Bible says that's faith without works. That's of no use. It's dead. Mm-hmm. We have to become active in the sense that if I see you have a need, especially if I'm a believer, um, it's not just for me to say, be encouraged. Right. May the Lord bless you. Right. <laughs> How about, do you need a sandwich? Right. Or let me just sit down with you or next next to you on a bench and have a coffee. Right. That's the thing, that that's what's needful to the body. It, you know. And so I think that that's where we miss it. Yeah. You know, It's not a big, you have to start a huge ministry. You just, can well, we be more empathetic? Too, it's, it's, it's invisible. You know, mm. the, the homeless situation, just take that for a minute. Mm-hmm. Even though the panhandlers are out or something, it still becomes invisible by people walking by him, you know, day in and day out and never really, you know, be in the hands of feet of Christ with some of these folks. So it's mm. even worse, though, for formerly incarcerated because it's like you're invisible, you know, with the whole thing. And then, of course, you know, the fear factor, as you would say, you know, yes. that kicks in. So uh, what are the pros and cons of being in this kind of ministry? Mm. Wow. Okay. Well, let's first of all deal with the fact that not everybody it's going to uh, receive the help and assistance that you give them. You know, there there'll be somebody. There's some people are going to use you. Mm-hmm. I've been burnt, mm-hmm. <laughs> for lack of better words, yep. several times. Mm-hmm. And you know, and that's with any ministry. And the right. cons are, you know, the pros are the fact that you know this is to glorify God. If nobody mm-hmm. sees what you're doing, at the end of the uh, end of the day, you walk away knowing that you have treasures in heaven because this is. What God has called us to do, as you mentioned earlier, with the, the main ten, two commandments that God has put on our hearts. And so I think that um, it, it's important that we focus on that. Mm-hmm. You know, if we're going to deal with people in general, let's let's make that our primary focus. Yeah. You know, and, and George, you, you, you quoted some statistical information and mm-hmm. it's absolutely shocking. And I know that Rita Mayfield, which is uh, uh, the congresswoman from, uh, you know, the district up there that you're in in Waukegan, North Chicago. And she's also you know, on our board. On yes. the board also. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm privileged to be with her. But my goodness, on one of the calls we had, I couldn't believe some of the things she was talking about, Stateville and some of these other things going on. Yeah. 
these young people been in there, and I don't know what that was called. But he actually didn't didn't do the crime, but they were proximity uh, to it or something. And let me let me mess you up for a few seconds. Yeah. I know we have to move on, but um, we we're close to Chicago right now. Mm-hmm. Um, you would probably think that Chicago has the worst statistics when it comes to mass incarceration. Mm-hmm. The most incarcerated zip code in the world is guess where? L.A. Oh, I'm glad you no, not L.A. I'm glad you said a big city like that. Mm-hmm. Where'd you say? Waukegan. That's close. Close. Milwaukee. Really? Wow. I would never. Yeah. <laughs> I would never in a million years assume that Milwaukee has the most incarcerated zip code in the world. Wow. Wow. So yeah. I, the, I had to read that and look it up again. I had to, But these statistics, these stats are available for everybody. Just to, It's right there. You can Google it. And so, um, you know, it's alarming. Mm-hmm. And we do need to address it. It's in our backyard. So is there an, is there an end game to this thing? Is there is it is this going to be just a never ending problem? Mass incarceration, recidivism. Mm. Um, just as the Bible tells us, the poor will always be with us. It, there there's some issues that because of sin, it'll always be in the community, always be in society until Jesus comes back. So are we trying to eradicate these problems? We're we're trying to we're, what we're trying to do is do like Jesus did. There's some people that He can heal. There's some people that you can heal. There's some people that you cannot. Right. And so we don't want to make a big issue about all the people that we cannot heal and, and the system that we cannot heal. But we want to be effective. We want to stand in the gap and say, okay, I can do something. I can play my part in the vineyard. Yep. And if people would just play their part, they don't have to take the whole pie. Just take a piece. Yeah, exactly. And I've got such a passion for this because it's an underutilized area. And with the, with the unemployment rate coming down, I just read a big article in Harvard Business Review about Iowa, which is doing, reaching into this category of people because finding people want to work, you know, and all that. Hey, listen, we're going to wrap this up, but I know you have uh, – let's let the audience know and the listeners how, how they can get a hold of you and some of the exciting things you've got coming up. Awesome. Would love for you just to come down to the office in Waukegan. Um, it would be great if you can go to the website, uh, www.legacyreentryfoundation.org. Uh, you can call us 800-573-8538. Um, there's a lot that we want to share with you. So go on the website and we'll have time to just really indulge in that. And if you need assistance, you want to talk to us personally, just go ahead and tap on uh, the, some of the information there that uh, we require and we'll get back to you. I know you're pretty proud of a couple things and it's your book. What's the book? Oh, you're working on a new one. Awesome. So big announcement. I have a new book called From Lockup to Legacy. I'm releasing on September 29th at our big gala that we're about to have in Libertyville, a connection church. Shout out to Lamar and Brenda Lark, our pastors. And then, of course, guess who's going to be our keynote speaker, Sheriff Mark Curran. Uh, this is Lake County's top cop. I got stories about him. Um, he's just really an advocate for for us and for people who've been incarcerated. So, I, I mean, there's so much I want to share with you. Um, please go on the website. We'll, we'll update you constantly. And you got youth programs. you got a community closet oh, that you guys have launched where you're helping these folks get clothing and needed goods. I mean, wow. Yes, youth and prevention. Um, also, every Thursday, we have the youth come out. And then also, we have a community closet uh, bi-weekly every fr- other Friday that you can come and receive clothes for free. Please tell mm-hmm. a friend. All right. Hey, listen, Bob Lair and Jennifer Valerio. We're here on AM 1160, Hope for Your Life, Faith Marketplace, every Saturday, noon to 1 o'clock. You've got to hang in here with us because this next portion, we're going to really nibble on a, a, a little bit of this subject. Where, that I'm going to tease you. When hiring, do you match a candidate with not only the job, but the company? This is Chicagoland's place to inspire, equip, and encourage Christian business leaders. Faith Marketplace Radio. Welcome back. We're here for our segment on the round table inspired by the book Proverbs for Business by Steve Marr. And the question is, when hiring, do you match the candidate with not only the job, but the company? And so our scripture is from Romans 12, 6, and it says, since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let each exercise them accordingly. So, Bob, George, you know, Proverbs for Business is telling us that there's two factors that are essential for maximum job satisfaction and success. 
Number one is a person's aptitude for the job. And number two is how well they fit within the organization. So, you know, let's look at this from the hiring manager's perspective. What are we looking at here? What's important? This is so great because maybe 20, 30 years ago, um, they have to fit a certain standard uh, to fit within the organization. But now if you look at places like Google and, you know, different companies, uh, some of these millennials, they don't dress like you dress or I dress. Uh, they may come in with a mohawk, you know, mm-hmm. but still have their MBA and still be the most intelligent person in the room, most creative and innovative. And so I think we have to look beyond, um, you know, whether the person initially looks like they fit And we have to begin to, you know, the interview process has to go further into, okay, what qualities do you have? And I think if we look at how they look, as soon as they walk in the door, that could stop the entire interview process. Yeah, there's no question about, you know, if they're tatted up or something like that. And I know people have covered themselves up with that because that sends kind of a message. But I think societally wise, particularly with the millennials and some of the things that are going out, we're starting to loosen that up. But you brought up a good point because if they don't, you know, first impressions are lasting impressions. And people do make judgments based on that. I'm hopefully we're moving, you know, less from that. But the simple fact, too, that something just happened that you brought up in studio here, too. What's yes. what wonderful thing is happening right now? Well, uh, Miss, you know, our illustrious state rep, <laughs> uh, Rita Mayfield, uh, just uh, worked on a, a bill um, not too long ago and to get it passed into the state of Illinois where – Whereas uh, somebody who has a background and they come in for an interview, they don't have to what they call mark the box. Mm. And that means that box that says, have you been incarcerated or locked up? Um, they don't have to do that. That gives not only the employer, you know, more time to, you know, see who this person really is, but the person who's being interviewed, they can really pitch you know, how they can fit into the company and how, you know, and not just be judged on their background, you know, and evaluated upon, okay, they did this 10 years ago, they're out the door. They that's a wonderful it. thing that you're going to be bringing to these p- folks that you're now mentoring and coaching and bringing through this whole thing is really how to take advantage of this new opportunity that had been given as to how they present themselves, right? Exactly. And, you know, in, in the jail, you know, when I share there on Wednesday nights, I was surprised. You no, know, I got 37 guys now, and they're they're intelligent. Mm-hmm. But a lot of them don't know this stuff. Mm. I was surprised. They don't know that when you go into a job in the state of Illinois, you may not have to mark the box. So they mm-hmm. they don't know that there's other opportunities. You can pitch yourself. You you right. know, um, if you don't have clothing, there's places you can go. We can give you clothing for free. So there's information we can share that will help them get back in the marketplace. Yeah. Yeah, that's some really good points. So. Let's let's get back to, though, of how well they can fit in the organization, because as a hiring manager, they're looking at not only matching the requirements for the, the skill sets, right, and experience, but also how are they going to blend in? So what can some of these hiring managers do, Bob, you know, to make sure that somebody is compatible within their organization? Well, uh, you know, as, as Pete Leonard, when he's on the show and gave us a few tips about how he goes through the interview process, he does it the same whether they're incarcerated or not. And, and part of that had been or, or not, and part of that was a good behavioral interview. It's really getting behind the surface of it and getting down underneath all of it to really find out who's the person that's really sitting here in front of me yeah. and what are the, the actual character, the qualities, and all those kind of things. I think once we get past this facade or this this you know perception of what things are, and I don't know how many times it's happened to you, but it certainly has happened to me where I perceive one thing of a person when I first meet him, and then all of a sudden it's like, whoa, wait a minute, you know, this is a whole different ball game we're dealing with here, you know, mm-hmm. and and to your point, George, you, you bringing them through that and having them take a look, really a hard, serious look at what are the qualities, what are the things that they stand for, uh, and bringing that out. Um, I think that's, that's what a really, pretty... I think that's a really good point, Bob. Is you know, push aside that resume mm-hmm. of what's written down on paper on the yeah. application or the checkmark box or not the box. Yes, and really just have a heart to heart conversation and get right. to know that person. You know, are they conversational? You know, do they really understand what's happening out there in society, in the marketplace, in on the job front? And if they don't, how can you equip them or help them? And some of those things can be taught. Right. I'm, you, I'm so glad you mentioned that because essentially um, working with somebody, employing someone is like a marriage yep. and everybody puts their best foot forward, you know, when they're getting ready, when they're in the courtship process. <laughs> you know, I always talk about the fact that we have premarital counseling, mm-hmm. but we don't have postmarital counseling. You really rarely hear that. And so, you know, you, like you said, you don't know who a person is 
until you actually get into a real relationship with them, right. until you live with them. Yep. And so, you know, if you're on the job eight hours a day, you spend most of your waking hours at the job place. Now I'm living with you. Now I get to see, wait, that's not what you said on the resume. Mm-hmm. So I believe there should be some post um, um, uh Hiring counseling, if, if if you will, there should be some. You know, we figure out where you want it, where you fit it, and then we put you in an environment. And they should have that for people that okay, this is you come in with a background, and we're going to coach you through this. And even mm-hmm. if you don't have a background, I, I believe there's some people that you find out different things about them. There needs to be some post marital counseling there <laughs> in yeah. any job. <laughs> well, effectively, we call it onboarding. You know, it's uh-huh. how they get onboarded and really being clear about what this what, what's expected. Mm-hmm. Uh, but also give them a taste of what the culture is. You know, are you going to mm. fit in here? Uh, we're getting, uh, physically, I'm excited with the millennials, much more of a diversified picture, you know, within the workplace now. Mm-hmm. So you're getting diversity of not only race, but you're also getting diversity of thought. Yes. And I think somebody, and I know you, George, and I've been with you, the richness that you've brought to my life with some of the stories and that one man thing you from, you know, going from lockup from to man. legacy, mm. that you did. I mean, it was so rich and so and just brought so much up that you, you don't think about that, you know, and you, the, people don't get exposed to that kind of thing. So yeah. um, I would say that those life's experiences, maybe particularly for the folks we're dealing with here, can be very rich as far as the stories yeah. we can tell. And the, mm-hmm. and the fact that they're open to learning and wanting yeah. to get better. I think that's an important thing. And again, Steve Marr stressed this uh, by saying just because someone has the necessary skills doesn't mean that they fit into the company. Mm. And so maybe we consider that somebody doesn't have those skills, but they're open to learning. Right. And But they, they do fit in because they're eager, they're passionate, and they want to help grow the company. Right. That is so key because being open to learn is just a, is a prerequisite for anybody. You, well, I know that's you know one of the things you, that, that uh, Pete does with them because he'll ask them, what did you do while you were incarcerated? Right. And what did you, you do to further yourself? You and know? are you willing to come into this environment and are you teachable? I yes. think that's the key. Yeah, are right. you yeah. Are you teachable? If not, then I don't think we have anything to go off of right, right. there. Yeah. But again, just just to say this, this new, this new age, millennials, they are uh, adapting mm-hmm. the office place uh, to them. Mm-hmm. The employers are making it so that it fits them now. Right. Uh, you have offices, the desk where people are standing up. You, like I mentioned Google earlier, uh, the Bay Area. I mean, people are doing some innovative things, and, and their companies are, are thriving mm-hmm. because they're meeting you know, them where they're at you know, right. and, and not using the old school well, method. Well, what I'm hearing is you know, people are willing to try something, and you've encouraged our listeners to begin with just even praying about it or reaching out to you. So wow. thank you, George, for, for being here. We really believe in what you're doing here with uh, Legacy Reentry Foundation. Now, there's going to be some changed lives out of this, and particularly since it is Christian-based and your faith is un- unshakable. Uh, the guys that come around, George, the people I've been exposed to with him, it's phenomenal. You can see the life is just raising up in them because of the love of Jesus Christ through you, brother. So wow. I just thank you so much again for being on the show again. Thank I can't you. believe we're running out of time. Again, Bob <laughs> Lambert, Jennifer Villarreal here every Saturday, noon to 1 o'clock on AM 1160. Hope for your life. We're Faith Marketplace, and we hope that you got inspired, equipped, and encouraged today to walk your faith out there in the marketplace and be the hands and feet of Christ. We're going to be back next Saturday. Saturday, noon to one o'clock. Thanks for joining us for Faith Marketplace Radio, here to inspire, equip, and encourage Chicagoland's Christian business community. Faith Marketplace is on every Saturday at noon, right here on AM 1160, Hope for Your Life. Listen to past shows anytime online at faithmarketplace.com.